Hello, welcome to Canadian Independent Media. It's October 1st. This week, tax policy, cannabis, and bank robberies. Last week, we entertained the idea that Main Street Media was whipping up hysteria over the coming legalization of cannabis in Canada. There were comments that we don't know enough about the plant, and anyway, its medicinal values are non-existent. This claim is in keeping with the United States Controlled Substances Act classifying the plant as a Schedule I drug, right up there with a long list of drugs including heroin, amphetamines, and psychedelics, all of which have no currently accepted medical use in treatment in the United States, they say. Oddly enough, the cannabis listing includes hemp and cannabinoids, which have little or no psychoactive properties. Just to set the record straight, First, here is a partial list for the uses of hemp, which date back over 10,000 years. And the list includes fuel, paper, food, rope, maps, clothes, nets, lace, soap, sails, shoes, plastics, explosives, caulking, methanol, bricks, charcoal, lubricants, oil, animal food, furniture, varnish, and the list goes on and on. And there are an estimated 50,000 commercial uses for this plant. Until about 100 years ago, almost all of the world's Bibles, maps, sales, clothes, and books were made out of the cannabis plant. And even cooked hemp seed porridge, called gruel, was a major subsistence food for most of the world's population. And if that's not enough, what about the medicinal uses for this plant? Research has found that cannabinoids have promise in the following diseases. Arthritis, chronic pain, migraines, depression, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, glaucoma, insomnia, lupus, autism, HIV AIDS, and even cancer. Being federally regulated, all Canadian provinces allow the use of medical cannabis. However, it must be proven that symptoms are not relieved by traditional treatments or pharmaceutical drugs. And because it is not covered by public health insurance, doctors can charge up to $400 just to fill out the paperwork. And finally, it's interesting to note that cannabis hysteria is completely overshadowed by the over 40,000 reported annual deaths back in 2007 in Canada for street and prescribed drugs, the majority of which were an adverse reaction to prescripted opioid medications. Gee, I wonder what that figure is now. We all know what happens when there's a bank robbery. Toronto now where police are searching for a man they say was involved in a bank robbery in the city's west end this morning. While multiple police units were uh, on the ground as well as snipers and a canine unit on the ground trying to figure out just exactly what took place this morning. But there were shots fired. One suspect is in custody and he's being treated at the hospital, Michael, but they are looking for that second suspect as we speak. But when the banks themselves are doing the robbing, things are a bit different. Earlier this week, CBC's Go Public team reported that three TD employees complained they are under intense and constant pressure to squeeze profit from customers by selling them products they didn't need. I feel bad. I feel bad for what they're making me do. Now, some employees say they have broken the law, trying to meet sales targets and keep their jobs, upgrading customers, extending lines of credit and credit card limits without customers' knowledge, a violation of the Federal Bank Act. Employees of TD Bank are saying that robberies are taking place daily at Canadian banks and they are the robbers. And they fear being fired by their bank if they don't do the robbing. People who work for TD and all the big banks are saying this.
the people who work at our banks are talking about falsifying documents, forging customer signatures, adding customers' initials to documents, and using whiteout to conceal information. And all of these robberies seem to have been disappeared. There's no police response, no police at the scene at TD headquarters in Toronto. There are no top bank executives in handcuffs. Is there even an investigation? I actually contacted the government to ask that question, but so far have not heard back. Maybe the people who run the banks don't know what the laws are. But I checked, and the chairman of the board of TD Bank is a lawyer. He's also chair emeritus of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts and the chancellor of Bishop's University. TD Chair Brian Levitt also won an award in 2014 for outstanding boardroom leadership. Is it outstanding to force your employees to cheat your clients and break the law in order to keep their jobs? It must be, because in 2015, the chair of TD Bank was also appointed to the Order of Canada for outstanding achievement, dedication to the community, and service to the nation. And I don't want to pick on TD Bank here, because they are probably not bigger crooks than any of the rest of the banks. And I'm sure Mr. Levitt is a very nice person. But it does look like if you are a bank that is robbing people, you can do quite well. But if you rob a bank, you do go to jail. So the vaulter is in prison. And how are the banks doing? And let's just remember what this is all about. Here, a CIBC employee says a financial advisor at the bank who, handed, who handled wealthy clients asked her almost two dozen times to forge customer signatures for insurance on loans, telling her that his clients would never notice the extra charges. That's how the banks and their media and their politicians treat us. Tax policy and tax rules are important if we want to have a better country. The corporate world and the 1% get a lot of tax breaks the rest of us don't have. For example, some private corporations can income sprinkle. This means business owners can pay wages, salaries, and etc. to other family members even if those people don't actually do any work for the company. This moves taxable income away from the owner who may be paying a high tax rate and moves it to family members who pay lower taxes or no taxes. The government says 50,000 Canadian families do this and save about $5,000 each in taxes, which is nice for them. Meanwhile, someone earning minimum wage here in BC would have to work about three months to earn that same $5,000 for their family. Many of Canada's wealthiest people use capital gains rules to reduce their taxes. A capital gain is when you buy something and then sell it for more. Let's say you work and make $50,000 a year. So, when you pay your taxes, you put down $50,000 as income. But if you make the same $50,000 from capital gains, you only have to put $25,000 as income. So you get to pay about half the taxes of someone who actually had to work a full year to make that money. Again, that's very nice for those who make their money from buying and selling things like stocks, bonds, buildings, or paintings, etc. That loophole costs governments about $5 billion in Canada every year, and the top 1% of income earners get half of that, which is $2.5 billion. Isn't that nice for the 1%? And, as the story says, those in the richest 1% of the 1%, they get about $1.1 million each in tax breaks from the capital gains tax. And if you're wondering why we never hear about this, it's because the folks who get the tax breaks own all the media. Over the last few decades in Canada, those at the bottom have been pushed further and further down, while those at the top really have far too much. Maybe it's time for a major public discussion about wealth and taxes in Canada. Maybe Canadians would like to have a tax system that makes us a better country, not a system that makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. Right now in Canada, the 86 richest families 
have as much wealth as the 11.4 million people at the bottom of the Canadian economic ladder. That is one of the costs of undemocratic government and corporate-owned media. Here's a Globe and Mail column on some small reforms the federal government says it wants to make now. The Globe, by the way, is owned by Canada's richest family, the Thompsons. So again, maybe it is time to look at tax policy in Canada. So that's it for this week from Canadian Independent Media. Thanks for watching. Um, be sure to subscribe to our channel and tune in next week for our next broadcast.